stop, I kind of, I think I may have gone down a little bit of a rabbit hole here, so I hope it'll be okay, because I'm actually going to start by talking a lot about visualisation. Um, yes, okay, so I'm trying to think about how we use these things and how we try and understand what we know about the past uh, and how creativity kind of plays into this thing. I'm sorry, yes, there is a photo of my dog. This is how I tend to do archaeology at the moment. I tend to sit on my laptop and usually a chihuahua jumps on me and I try and work around him. Um, and we do this, I mean, we're doing our work, but the aim of our work is to understand how we know how people lived in the past. What do we know about those things? Uh, to get there, we go through a whole kind of stream of bits and pieces. We look at archaeological remains, we look at archival sources, we look at standing remains. We go all through this process of assessing what, um, what kind of knowledge is out there, what uh, information or data is available. Through this, we then kind of collate, we model, or we analyse all these bits and pieces, and we try and put that together, try and figure out and generate an interpretation. Um, but we still don't know how people lived in the past. We still don't know exactly that things. We, we've only created an interpretation of these things. Um, and in my opinion, that's kind of that bridge there and how we can get to it. We can kind of start to begin to employ uh, creativity as a mechanism to kind of bring that bridge a bit closer together. And I don't see that as necessarily a problem. I don't think we need to be necessarily more scientific or data -related. It's just another methodology for us to kind of explore those things. Uh, and I was thinking of this specifically in relation to visualisations. I started off uh, my work looking at how we can visualise the past, how we can create uh, 3D models. So I'm a digital archaeologist, kind of. I'm something like a digital archaeologist most of the time. Um, and I teach 3D modelling to my students at the University of York. Um, and we create images like these, and to create images like these, these are always critiqued, nearly always critiqued by everyone in the world, it's just being pretty pictures. They're generated, um, they're too subjective, they're too much based on an artistic narrative. Um, and I spend a lot of time with other 3D modellers who also, we, we talk about our processes we go to, through to get to creating these images. So we, have, um, we often start with things like our 3D data. So whether that's total station data or it's laser scans or photogrammetry models, uh, basically stuff based on standing remains. We bring this together with other bits of information, like uh, I, haven't, I couldn't find a nice pretty picture to represent an archival resource or an excavation record, but I've got some nice objects and I've got some bits and pieces from manuscripts. And all of those things contribute and we bring those things all together into one place to create these images. But have we do this, and this, this is kind of an infographic I've been working on for a while, and sometime I'm going to make it look super fancy. Uh, but that day is not today. But we bring all these things together, and it's actually quite a rounded process. But there's some parts of this where, actually, we just don't know everything, do we? we there's a certain point where we're going through collating all this data, and we have to step beyond the information we've got in front of us and employ our imaginations to create something that actually works. There's always going to be that corner of a building which doesn't have the rest of the building there. And are we employing, uh, is it our imaginations, is it our creativity that are filling that gap, or is that a scientific uh, kind of instruction? Um, and in the world of visualisation, that's been quite accepted. So I have this conversation quite a lot, especially when I'm a bit bored, when I don't really want to be doing my work with Dr Anthony Massington, or Grant Cox, or Dr uh, Alice Watterson. We spend a lot of time on picking these ideas and how we produce these methodologies. And we try and put it on paper for people to explain, this is how you create a 3D model. This is how you create a reconstruction, if you will, uh, a visualisation. Um, but there's always this method where you hit these points where you're, does it actually look right? Am I happy with that output? And what makes you make those decisions? Um, so those two there. I'm going to move beyond this and think, start thinking about acoustic heritage. Because in acoustic heritage, this hasn't been greatly... Um, engaged with yet. People aren't quite happy with this idea that there's a little bit more, there's something a little bit more intangible about sound. There's something less reliable that we can link up to. Um, we still work on things like room dimensions. So this is an architectural plan of House of Commons in 1834. We still work off these things like building survey data. Oh, that is not the slide I thought it was going to be. Uh, we also still work on um, uh, things like this. These are um, these are thinking about the surface properties of rooms. So these represent the same things as we would think about when we're thinking about textures and how rooms are filled and what, what makes light look like light in these spaces. And instead we're thinking about how sound reflects and how sound is absorbed within a space. So actually, 
the process is very, very similar. We still go through the same loop. And I think why we're not necessarily willing to engage with creativity so much when we're thinking about acoustic heritage and sound, because we still have those two points where we have to think about these things. I'm really hoping this is a side I think it is. It is. There we go. Um, it's because these three things are largely considered on a visual basis. We're taking very much visual cues to assess whether we are accurately modelling our sounds or not. And these, this, what these two as well, they're kind of, they, these are the only ones that really consider how things sound. And I think that's why we're less happy with engaging with creativity so much in the world of acoustic heritage. So I'm going to walk this through in a kind of in, through a case study. This is the Listening to the Commons project, which just finished at the University of York, and this is my postdoc. This project brought together archaeologists, me, um, acousticians, so Professor Damien Murphy, uh, historians, Dr John Cooper, alongside um, parliamentary archivists and um, people who work in the parliamentary archive collection, Mari, I can't remember her surname, and Melanie Youngwin, sorry, um, and they were responsible for the Vote 100 project at York, um, at York, uh, Vote 100 project at Parliament this summer. That is a blank slide. That's a very good start. Okay. So the story I'm going to be telling is the story of women in politics in the 19th century, very specifically the very beginning of the 19th century. So in 1778, up until 1778, women used to be able to sit in the public galleries at the House of Commons and listen to the debates that were happening in the House of Commons itself. In 1778, they were removed during a general clearing of strangers from the galleries and they were no longer allowed to return. During this period, um, there's no kind of hearing how women engaged uh, like directly with politics during the time but from 1818 onwards we start to hear about women sitting in a space known as the ventilator so that's a space that sat in the attic directly above the house of commons and they used to congregate here to hear the debates that were going on and some of these were very very well relevant to women such as uh, the application um, one of the first petitions for women to get the vote in 1832 um, and here is the space i'm talking about the ventilator and these are three of the stunning images that we have from the period and you can see women huddling or you can see them looking through at the um, house of commons below there the voice and vote exhibition ran at parliament this summer did anyone go no no never mind 107,000 other people went so that's pretty good at least uh, and this exhibition told the story of um the first 200 years of women engaging in politics or the last 200 years of women engaging in politics at the house of commons and we started at our space the ventilator this is um, as a starting point for the story. And um, we created a ventilator and they wanted to allow people to engage with this space more than just visually. We wanted to think about how, what women would hear. Um, so we started off with a series of reconstructions created by Dr. Anthony Massington of the Virtual St. Stephen's Project and that's based at the Centre of Christianity and Culture at York. Uh, he provided me with these images, a series of uh, digital plans um, of these architectural drawings, so he's already created those in 3D space. And I converted these to acoustic models. Uh, these are created in catacoustic. I always stick this image in, it doesn't look very exciting, it doesn't look very beautiful, but that's what acoustic modelling is. It's modelling in how, how sound worked on different surface properties, not how sound looks, if that makes sense. So it doesn't, doesn't take into account how things always looked. Each of those polygons represents scattering properties and absorbing properties of a surface. So for example, carpets tend to absorb sound, uh, and these walls actually reflect sound. Uh, so I, my example I always use is everyone sounds good singing in the bathroom because all the surfaces are reflective. Whereas you don't sound as good singing in uh, your living room because all the sound gets absorbed into the carpets and the curtains and the soft furnishings. Um, and then we convolve it. Um, we convolve the results of that model, so what's known as the room impulse response, uh, with an anechoic sound. So just to demonstrate. So this is an anechoic sound. It's a sound recorded um, in a dead room, so a room which has no reverberation or response to it. The very, very strange place is on at the University of Southampton, and you can't hear yourself moving around. You can't hear your footfalls, and if someone's on the other side of the room, you can't hear them speak. So I convolved. Um, so this is just an example of the convolution. This has been convolved with the room impulse response from the House of Commons. So you can 
see, you can really kind of change the atmosphere of a place by doing these things. Okay, so this is where the negotiating creativity comes in. First thing, we didn't have any relevant sounds necessarily um, from a 19th century debate in the House of Commons. So um, we borrowed the House of Commons of today and took some MPs in there and got them to recreate a series of speeches from, um, from the right period. So that's pretty fun. And we used that as an imperator. So then I had to dull these down before convolving them. So I had to kind of really dampen them up. Um, so this is the kind of first run at everything. It's the 12th of May, 1789, and William Wilberforce is delivering a speech in support of the abolition of the slave trade. <laughs> So I'm going to cut that short, because you can't really hear it, can you? While we might have carefully modelled this space, we've spent a long time kind of thinking about surface properties of the room, looking at all the available evidence, it just doesn't work, does it? It, it sounds very, very interesting, and actually I think it's, it's kind of interesting parallel, because I think it would be very difficult to listen here, but we knew it couldn't possibly be accurate. And this is where the negotiating creativity comes in. We couldn't put that into an exhibition and accept, accept people to be engaged with this story. It would be something they'd just kind of walk over and not really think about. So this is where we had to start thinking about it. So actually, we went back to the beginning of that cycle I showed you to begin with. We looked back through the surface properties and tweaked those. We had to think about what those things might change, what needed to change slightly to make this more accepted. We know this ventilator is made of iron or metal. Perhaps the fact that the space is a little bit too small, the software couldn't quite deal with it and created much more of a vibrant space than it needed to be. So this is the ventilator in place uh, just before it went live. You can see we recreated uh, one of those paintings and these are the exhibition organisers there. And this is what we came up with instead. And I'd say while we had to change, make these decisions to change how we had modelled the sound, I don't think that takes away from the accuracy or the engagement with this kind of story. 3rd of August, 1832, and Henry Hunt is presenting a petition in support of women's suffrage. Sir Frederick Trench responds. I'm going to cut it short because I think I'm running out of time, uh, which makes me sad. Um, but if you want to listen to it, I have a whole stream of them available and hopefully we're going to put them online soon. Um, uh, there we go. So just to kind of sum everything up and bring it back together, I said that we had to negotiate a level of creativity, but I think that level of creativity wouldn't be questioned quite so aggressively if we were talking about visualisation, if we were talking about uh, creating 3D reconstructions. And I think that's because of a whole series of the kind of statements put up here. We consider visual dominant sense, we rely on it more, we understand it a bit more. So we feel able to critique things on how they look and do they look right. Whereas if they don't sound right, we're less comfortable making those decisions. As you heard there, the two oralizations were quite different, weren't they? One was very, very reverent, one was less so. Um, but I still think you got the story across, especially about how MPs still behave remarkably similarly <laughs> and interrupt each other and use the building against each other. Um, and I think that's an element we need to kind of approach more aggressively in acoustic heritage when we're thinking about these things and we should be embracing our creativity and that kind of the fact that we can use it to kind of close that bridge slightly on where we are now and the past itself. Um, 
Thank you, I hope that's okay. Thank <laughs> you.